Good morning. My name is Michael Brad Bayless. I am the founder of Bayless Healthcare. Today, for our didactic session, we have a very interesting topic concerning medication and bipolar disorder. Individuals who suffer from bipolar disorder often require a trial process with medication in order to reach therapeutic effectiveness. Today, we have Dr. Marcel Leet, who is a preeminent psychiatrist and an expert in the area of bipolar disorder. I hope you enjoy this most informative topic and learn how bipolar disorder can be managed by medication and therapeutic intervention. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here and what we're going to be doing today is a review of the psychopharmacologic management of bipolar disorder. Um, And this, this book is a wonderful reference. Um, many of the slides have been taken from the book. Um, it's a compendium of information, a very small one, but uh, succinct about psychopharmacology. Um, and, and one of the chapters is on bipolar disorder. There are many books out there, though, that you should think about uh, specifically for therapists to help you understand psychopharmacology. This um, lecture is one that I gave to psychiatry residents, but I, I modified it a little bit. I took out some of the more complicated um, mechanisms and so forth. I don't really know that I understand them all myself. And um, for me, it's really more important how the medications work in patients. So we're going to look at mood stabilizers, and we're going to focus on lithium, Depakote or valproate and carbamazepine or tegretol, lamotrigine or lamictal, uh, and the antipsychotics, both the first generation and second generation antipsychotics, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, we're also going to look at an interesting uh, um, kind of alternative in the omega 3 fatty acids. So, lithium, if some of you came to the lecture I did, uh, the earlier part of the year, we, we talked about the history of lithium. Lithium is a, an element um, that um, became popular in the United States in the uh, 1800s and was produced um, uh, to add to water and, and made something called lithia water. And it was, you know, like a popular soda drink or something in the day. But it it came out of favor because of uh, experiences where it was used as a salt substitute instead of uh, sodium chloride. It was substituted, uh, and people became toxic and died, and so everybody became very afraid of lithium. But a, uh, a very brave uh, psychiatrist, John Cade, in Australia did some in interesting experiments on guinea pigs, of all things. He was a psychiatrist in a long-term psychiatric facility in Australia, and he, he um, noted that lithium added to their feed um, caused a calming effect, and he had a number of backward patients who, you know, could never leave the hospital, um, and he tried it with them, and they had a very good response, and he wrote a, a, a seminal paper uh, on the use of lithium. Unfortunately, it wasn't widely read, but uh, in 1969, lithium again was used in the United States and proved to be um, quite beneficial. Mogens Shu, a researcher, um, I believe he's English, uh, did another paper about the evidence for lithium being an effective mood stabilizer, and that really was the beginning of its use widely. So the pharmacologic effects of lithium are many, and I don't think people really understand clearly why it works, but it seems to modulate the balance between excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters. It enhances the transmission of 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin. It affects uh, the excretion of norepinephrine in uh, interesting ways um, in it does, uh, it affects it in one way in patients who are uh, depressed and another way in patients who are manic. Um, 
and it also affects uh, dopamine receptors. So it has the full uh, spectrum of uh, effects on neurotransmitters. Lithium um, is used in a number of areas. One is to uh, control the acute uh, psychopathology in a manic episode or in agitation or aggression and uh, different kinds of psychiatric conditions by po uh, borderline personality, uh, violent prisoners, and those with uh, mental retardation who have violent outbursts. Um, it also is used in, uh, to uh, treat uh, milder forms uh, of episodic um, depression and irritability. And it's used as a prophylactic agent and a preventive agent in the maintenance uh, treatment of, uh, to prevent future episodes of um, uh, mood problems. And it's used as an adjunctive agent to antidepressants to treat um, uh, patients with major depression. So it has many different uses. It's also used um, in schizophrenia spectrum disorders um, such as uh, schizoaffective disorder um, and uh, can be used as a, in combination with uh, uh, antipsychotics in a subgroup of patients who have brief episodic angry outbursts, in other words, a mood type uh, phenomenon in those folks. And uh, it's used in depressive disorders because of its anti-suicide properties and it, again, as an adjunct to tricyclic antidepressants serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. It has a, a number of side effects which make it problematic to use and probably best handled by psychiatrists and, and those who know how to use lithium because it has a very narrow therapeutic index. In other words, its therapeutic dose and its toxic dose are very close together, so it requires frequent blood monitoring. So tremor, a very fine hand tremor is present in many uh, individuals who take lithium, and it's really only a problem if you happen to be a diamond cutter or something where you need very fine motor control. Extrapyramidal side effects including um, uh, muscle tension and akesthesia, which is a sense of uh, restlessness, slowed mentation and forgetfulness. There's controversy about its effects on creativity. Many people with bipolar disorder happen to be artists or writers or that's a whole other lecture, very interesting lecture. But um, And they're sometimes resistant to taking medications for their mood problems because they feel it, it uh, affects their ability to be creative. <coughs> but the, the evidence is really that um, the vast majority of people who take lithium who <coughs> happen to be uh, creative individuals don't have any uh, change in that. It causes nausea. Um, it, you can uh, get around that by using longer acting agents. Um, weight gain is a problem for some. It has an insulin uh, like effect and drops blood sugar so people <coughs> are hungry and they, eat, they tend to eat more. Um, it can cause hypothyroidism in some individuals. Polyuria and polydipsia, excessive thirst and urination. Diabetes insipidus is the, uh, on one end of the spectrum where people urinate volumes of uh, fluid and uh, get into a lot of trouble. That's fairly rare. Renal insufficiency over time has been a, um, a worry with lithium, so it's important to be monitored closely. And it has uh, cardiovascular effects it can ag aggravate psoriasis and can cause acne. So it has a, uh, it's a difficult agent sometimes to use. Depakote or valproate uh, or valproic acid is um, another popular mood stabilizer. Um, it was, it's been around since the 1960s, first identified in France. Um, in the United States, uh, doctors at McLean Hospital in Boston showed that it uh, had a 54% improvement in a mania rating score, which is pretty impressive, uh, in the valproate group versus uh, the placebo group. And uh, two other researchers uh, in 1995 found that it, that it was equivalent to uh, lithium in effectiveness in acute mania. 
the interesting thing about all of the other medications I'm going to talk about besides lithium is that they're more effective in mixed states. Mixed states are where um, patients have uh, criteria, they meet criteria for both mania and depression at the same time for at least seven days. So they, they're very confusing patients to kind of evaluate. Um, but the, the anticonvulsant mood stabilizers like Depakote, carbamazepine, and so forth are much better agents to treat both mixed states and rapid cycling. Rapid cycling is where you have at least, or you have more than four episodes of uh, mania or depression in a year. Um, lithium's not so good for those two, the mixed states and the rapid cycling. And it's useful in patients who have a history of electroencephalogram abnormalities in addition to their bipolar disorder. We know it's an effective prophylactic agent, so it's useful to prevent episodes and um, also effective as a maintenance agent. Um, it, it's been used as well to, uh, as an add-on uh, to second-generation antipsychotics, and we're going to talk about the difference between first-generation and second-generation a little bit in decompensating uh, schizophrenics. Uh, it's been useful in agitation and dementia, and this is a big deal now because there's a big push by uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare to reduce the use of antipsychotics in demented nursing home patients, so this is an option to use. Um, it's helpful in uh, impulsivity and explosive outbursts um, and physical aggression and brain injury and retardation. I just had somebody yesterday um, who'd had a history of a brain injury from a motor vehicle accident and he was, he had these episodic periods where he was very, very um, unstable from a mood standpoint and he ended up twisting his um, his stepmother's arm and was picked up by the police and this would be a great agent to use with him or at least try with him. Um, panic disorder, this is a, a, an interesting kind of alternative treatment for panic um, and affective instability and impulsivity associated with borderline personality. Um, side effects, common ones are sedation and GI distress. Um, Hepatotoxicity and pancreatitis necessitate that we get lab work before we prescribe this medication to ensure the person's stable. Unfortunately, weight gain is a real problem with a lot of these agents, lithium and, and Depakote. Um, thrombocytopenia is a, a drop in the blood clotting cells. The um, alopecia is loss of hair, which can be very distressing. And in women, polycystic ovaries, and and any of the prescribing any of the uh, anticonvulsants in childbearing age women is problematic, and they have to be cautioned about use of birth control. It can cause neural tube defects. Carbamazepine is another anticonvulsant um, mood stabilizer synthesized in 1957. Its main use is to treat temporal lobe epilepsy and trigeminal neuralgia. But in the 1970s, um, the Japanese found that it was effective in, uh, in bipolar disorder in patients who were refractory to lithium or who didn't have any benefit from lithium. And then, uh, again, in uh, the Ballinger and Post uh, um, in America, reported it was effective in a double blind cross over study which was the you know the gold standard for uh, proof of efficacy it's interesting that that carbamazepine's never been approved uh, as an agent for bipolar disorder by the FDA until its um, long acting uh, form equito or equeto i've never used it was released in 2005 I'm sure it costs a fortune because carbamazepine is a generic um, that could probably cost pennies a day. Um, and you know, I agree with this statement. Overall, it's regarded as a, a less good um, first choice than Depakote lithium or a second-generation antipsychotic because it has 
a number of problems with drug interactions. Um, it's, it's indicated in acute mania, again, uh, in mixed and rapid cycling patterns, and preferentially in more severe paranoid and angry manic patients. Um, I kind of always thought of lithium as the neutral drug and Depakote as the girl drug and carbamazepine as the boy drug. It's used frequently in prison settings for, you know, violent patients. Um, and it may be useful in continuous cycling people. It's unfortunate where they never have a period of normal mood or euthymia between their episodes, so they're just continuously cycling. Um, it, it may be uh, useful in treating violent non-psychotic uh, individuals, again, people like borderline personality, um, post-traumatic stress, um, and dementia, another, another option for uh, a non-psychotic to be used in demented individuals who may be agitated. Um, again, this has a number of side, uh, side effects which are very problematic. Um, malcoordination, diplopia, and sedation. Diplopia is double vision. And typically you see this sort of nystagmus, this beating gait in the eyes if you ask the person to move their eyes. Follow your finger. And those are all d uh, dose related uh, problems. Agranulocytosis and aplastic anemia are very, very serious problems where you basically kill all your blood cells. And um, that's uh, extremely worrisome in trying to, you know, prescribe this for somebody. Again, thrombocytopenia or loss of clotting cells and leukopenia, which is um, the loss of your infection-fighting cells. Um, interesting that it's almost double in children uh, to adults, so very, I want to be very cautious with using it in kids. Tiredness, uh, nausea, it's unspelled um, wrong here. Dizziness, um, elevated liver functions, um, and rashes, sedation, and slowing of cardiac conduction. Lamotrigine or Lamictal is another anticonvulsant agent that's used in uh, bipolar disorder. And by the way, you know, I, I have a handout. Did I give it to you? No. Yeah. Did somebody take it? You can read it before you go. I can just stay this on my yeah. computer. And the, there was a, a print a handout of the... Uh, oh, you have the I handout? Have okay. Can okay. No, no, no. I was just saying that you could make copies of it. Okay. Um, let's see. Where was I? Um, another of the anticonvulsant mood stabilizers um, approved for complex, uh, partial complex and generalized seizures. Um, in the 1990s, um, it was looked at for bipolar disorder when, interestingly, you know, a lot of things in psychiatry happen uh, by chance. And if some of you were at the lecture I gave in the early part of the, when was that? August, August okay. Um, you know, a lot of discoveries in psychiatry happened by chance. The people who were being treated with monoamine oxidase inhibitors for t tuberculosis didn't have any benefit of their tuberculosis, but they got happy. And so that was, you know, discovered as an antidepressant agent. Well, this is the same thing happened. People were, um, who were epileptic were treated with this medication, and it probably helped their epilepsy, but it also seemed to help their mood. So. Um, you know, th there were trials done to, to show whether it really did have an anti-manic uh, effect. Um, it, it didn't have much benefit in treating mania, but it has uh, benefit in treating depression and in, um, in, in um, increasing the time to um, episodes of uh, depression and mania. Um, and eventually was approved for maintenance treatment of bipolar disorder in 2003. Um, I use it when people are, you know, having problems with depression. We'll talk about that in a second. It's, it's interesting. Uh, 
mania gets the press because people, you know, can be really wild and crazy when they're high, you know, highly manic, but depression is the worst part of bipolar disorder. People spend a lot of time being severely depressed. So, um, it again, like the other uh, anticonvulsant mood stabilizers, is effective in treating rapid cycling in mixed states. 48% um, uh, of patients in, in a depressed episode had marked improvement. Um, and it may be uh, effective in cyclothymia, which is kind of uh, bipolar light with episodes of uh, dysthymia and, um, and um, hypomania, as well as resistant depression and schizoaffective disorder. And again, borderline personality, that keeps showing up here. Um, Similar to uh, carbamazepine, it can cause dizziness, double vision, unsteadiness, sedation. Um, decreased libido. You know, it's interesting. Decreased libido as a side effect is one of the most problematic, you know, in a lot of uh, psychiatric treatments. Rash. This is, this is the most uh, serious issue. Some people have an uncomplicated rash um, that's not really bothersome. It's just, you know, kind of annoying, but as a, a psychiatrist or prescriber of this medication, you have to differentiate it from the beginnings of uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome where people really, s they kind of slough off their skin and it, it's a, another um, term is toxic epidermal necrolysis. The first layer of skin actually dies and, um, and it can be life-threatening. So. You have to recognize the difference between a, uh, a, an uncomplicated rash and this, you know, terrible uh, risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, and the risk increases if the dose is raised too rapidly. So that's a very slow taper upward, which makes it kind of complicated. Or when it's added to Depakote, so there's a double whammy with Lamotrigine and Depakote together. The, the thing that makes this so attractive is that it's one of the least likely to cause weight gain. So sometimes it's used inappropriately to treat manic episodes in patients who are, you know, extremely fearful of weight gain, but it's not a very effective anti-manic agent by itself. More effective is a prevention of and treatment of depression and bipolar. I just threw this one in. Um, because I had a case where the person, you know, wasn't responding. This was a, an, in, an inpatient unit. She wasn't responding to any of the agents we were using. And I had read this article by Stoll uh, about the use of omega-3 fatty acids in mania. And so we put her on it. It was like miraculous. Interesting that, you know, within two days, you know, her mood started to settle down a little bit. Unfortunately, she forgot to tell us she was allergic to fish. So she started to get a rash and we had to take her off of it and I, you know, I just remember that it helped a lot. So it's, an, uh, it's a potential, um, you know, alternative to the use of some of these agents, you know, in patients, for instance, maybe a pregnant woman, you might want to try this as an alternative. Um, so. And interestingly, you know, um, just the whole background of the omega-3s, people with mood disturbances and affective illness tend to have um, deficiencies of omega-3 fatty acids. And in Asian countries where people eat a lot of fish, they tend to have lower rates of um, depression. So there's some, and there's been a lot of work in the United States, especially at Harvard by a fellow named Andrew Stoll uh, on the use of fatty acids in mood uh, disorders. Um, so here's uh, Stoll. Um, so people who are treated with omega-3s tend to experience longer remissions and more complete resolution of symptoms than placebo-treated patients. So there is evidence that it, it can be beneficial. Um, and actually the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, has endorsed the use of 
uh, a combination of EPA and DHA, the two components uh, in patients with mood, impulse control, and psychotic disorders. And I, I think, you know, there's not a lot of work. I think the new horizon in psychiatry is going to be the deeper exploration of nutritional interventions. I think, you know, there was a study done, this is very interesting, I, I, of teenage boys who were incarcerated in a juvenile detention facility in England. Um, and they, they had, you know, they had data on uh, things like assaults and people being put in, in solitary confinement because of their behavior and stuff. And somebody had the bright idea to supplement them with, um, with a multivitamin, basically. I mean, it was a jazzed up multivitamin, but it essentially had all the elements. And they could see over time the number of assaults and things, you know, go down tremendously. And the thinking is that some of these kids, because of, um, you know, they c tended to come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, that they may have suffered from nutritional deficiencies since childhood. And that may have, um, you know, contributed to their ending up in an, uh, uh, incarcerated. So there's a lot to be explored um, in this area, and I don't think anybody's really, you know, consistently explored it. But, you know, one of the first lines in, in that I try to do with patients is talk about their nutritional status and are they, you know, do they have a good balanced diet and that kind of thing. So, let's see. Anti, the antipsychotics, this is very interesting. You know, the first generation antipsychotics um, began with the uh, synthesis of chlorpromazine uh, in the 1950s in France. And um, that was really the beginning of the modern era and the treatment of psychotic disorders. Um, and, you know, there was really, that was uh, of the revolution, really, in the, the treatment of psychosis. and. It eventually led to the um, deinstitutionalization of many individuals who could formerly not leave um, long-term care facilities like state hospitals. And then, uh, you know, after the census of chlorpromazine came another, you know, dozen or so antipsychotic medications. I, I didn't put all the first generation up there. Um, and then in the 1980s, Actually, in Europe in the 1970s, um, clozaril or clozapine was uh, discovered and used widely uh, and found to be a superior agent in the treatment of uh, resistant schizophrenia. And um, unfortunately, uh, after several years of use, the pattern was noted of um, some people developing um, agranulocytosis or a loss of their uh, infection fighting cells and dying um, from that and so it was withdrawn from the market but because it had been so superior to every other agent there were um, uh, requests for compassionate need use and it came back on the market in a limited way but with a bundling of laboratory work so you had to check blood work every week if you prescribed this medication Eventually, the FDA approved it in the United States in 1989, I believe, and again, it was bundled with the requirement for once a week um, complete blood counts, and um, it cost a lot of money. It cost $10,000 a year, you know, in the uh, early 90s to prescribe this medication. And I remember I was uh, the medical director at the state hospital at the time, and we got a grant for $300,000 to prescribe this medication to 30 of our most severely ill people. And there were a number, a, f a few individuals who'd been there for 30 years who were well enough to actually leave the hospital. And it was re really amazing. Um, one. F family member said, you know, there's actually a person there. You know, that they hadn't seen that person since, you know, he was 15 <coughs> or something. But again, Clozaril is a very difficult drug to prescribe. It has a number of different side effects. Um, it's like a very dirty drug. 
You know, it causes weight gain, it causes blood pressure problems, it causes this 1% risk of fatal agranulocytosis, um, and there's a million other things. Um, and then we have, you know, the newer agents, Risperdal, Risperdone, Olanzapine, Zyprexa, Quetiapine, Seroquel, Zeprazidone, Geodon, Aripiprazole, Abilify, and then the three new ones that are not much in use, Iloperidone, Acenapine, and Lorazidone. So the thing that distinguishes the first generation from the second generation is um, the first generation tend to have worse extrapyramidal side effects, tremor, muscle stiffness, and this sense of restlessness, especially if they're high potency agents like Haldol. They also have uh, the risk of a long-term, um, um, sometimes disfiguring uh, movement disorder called tardive dyskinesia. If you, if you uh, dissect the word tardive means late occurring and dyskinesia is abnormal movement, so late occurring abnormal movement. And, um, you know, it can be terrible, you know, facial movements and just a bunch of weird stuff. You don't want to have a patient develop. Sedation can be a problem with the low potency agents as can blood pressure changes, decreased libido and anticholinergic uh, problems dry mouth, blurry vision, and constipation. The second generation have their own problems, but they tend to have less in the way of extrapyramidal side effects, although you can still get all those things plus tardive dyskinesia with the second generation, but tend to be less frequent. Weight gain is the major problem with most of these, with one exception, and we'll talk about that. Um, and, you know, weight gain then leads to diabetes and other uh, problems. Increased lipids is another issue, put, putting people at risk for cardiovascular problems. Sedation, anticholinergic uh, side effects, cardiovascular side effects, decreased libido, et cetera. So it's, you know, you know with, with this second generation, the hope was, wow, we have wonder drugs now that aren't going to cause so many side effects, but they just give us a different side effect profile. But anyway, these agents are approved for the treatment of bipolar disorder. Um, chlorpromazine, the first agent, uh, is approved for acute mania. Aripiprazole, or Abilify, is the one antipsychotic that tends not to cause weight gain. Along, there's some other ones, Geodon and, and uh, Risperdal tend to have less uh, weight gain, but Abilify is a big one. Um, and it, you, you know, you can see there's a list here of what they're approved for, various, uh, you know, the drug companies want to get their drugs approved for everything, um, but they have to prove that they're useful in the treatment of, of these uh, conditions. So mo most of the first generation are useful in treating um, most of the phases of bipolar disorder. So how, you know, you have a kind of little overview of all the agents we can use, but w how do you go about treating people psychopharmacologically? So in acute mania, this is actually the, the least problematic phase to treat um, because people spend, tend to spend less time in mania or hypomanic states uh, or uh, mixed states, and there are a number of good uh, treatment options, the first generation agents, um, the anticonvulsants, and lithium. It's very gratifying as a psychiatrist to, to work in an inpatient setting and have somebody who's talking a mile a minute, you know, racing around the unit, uh, punning, joking, whatever, uh, and you treat them and within a few days they look better. You know, it's really, uh, it's really fun to kind of watch that. So the, the new paradigm is that second generation antipsychotics are the first line treatment for um, acute mania, they tend to work rapidly. So within a few days you see some benefit. They are, they have less in the way of extrapyramidal side effects than the first generation agents um, and greater effectiveness in uh, maintenance treatment and in treating bipolar depression. 
So, you know, when looking at the data, when you look at these agents, they have a 53% response rate versus 30% for placebo. So there is a, a difference. It always amazes me that there's such a big response for <laughs> placebo. The power of the mind. Um, so first generation agents like haloperidol um, or clopromazine, they probably work as well, but nobody's ever done studies uh, to show this. And these agents, you know, because they've been around so long, are you know you can get all of them in generic form and are, don't cost much. And if any of you have worked with patients who are trying to get some of the newer second generation agents, they cost a fortune. You know, um, seven hundred dollars a month. How can people afford that? If they're, you know, and the insurance companies don't want to pay for it either. Mm -hmm. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to do it. Um, so, you know, again, the, the classic mood stabilizers uh, are useful as either standalone agents or in combination with other agents for acute mania. The problem with using these um, is that they take a week to 10 days, and lithium can take up to two weeks to have an effect, even at, at the therapeutic level. Um, and sometimes you, you know, start a patient on a particular dose, and you have to wait a few days to get a blood level done, and then you go up again. Um, so they require this need to titrate the dose. And in this day and age, um, you know, all the insurance companies want to give you three days in the hospital and that's it. So it's really can be a problem to treat people with medications that you have to, you know, titrate and get levels on and so forth. So again, these are these are good agents if you had the time to use them. But um, I think people have moved to the second generation antipsychotics because of their rapid sort of benefit. Um, so this says uh, to start treatment with a second generation or first generation agent, and then if the patient's unresponsive, you add a mood stabilizer. My own paradigm is to start both together with the hope that at some point I can get rid of the antipsychotic and just keep the person on the mood stabilizer. And then benzodiazepines are used a lot, things like uh, clonazepam and Ativan and so forth, um, to help patients who are very agitated to sleep, you know, to reduce anxiety and uh, to reduce agitation. This is the, the harder uh, phase to treat. This is very interesting. You know, 32% of people with bipolar 1, classic bipolar disorder, who have manias alternating with periods of depression, severe depression, spend a third of their lives being depressed and only 9% in manic states. So, you know, these people, that's what makes bipolar disorder so um, very problematic because people tend to kill themselves in those very depressed states. Bipolar 2 is an interesting um, disorder. I, I'm, you know, bipolar 2 is where people have periods of hypomania where you're more creative, you have more energy, you get more things done. I mean, it would be great to bottle that and have it all the time. And I think a lot of individuals who are very successful, captains of industry and so forth, may have a bit of bipolar too. But unfortunately, they only spend 1% of their time in that, you know, really kind of jazzed up state that we'd all like to be in all the time. But 50% of their time in this severe depressed state. So this, again, I've said this, most difficult poll to treat. Um, there are few proven strategies. You know, people think, well, if you're depressed, just give them antidepressants. But, you know, that can be very problematic in bipolar disorder because you can, you know, you can end up speeding up the cycles or rarely you can flip somebody into a manic state from depression. So use of antidepressants is not particularly helpful. Uh, these are the approved, in other words, FDA approved treatments for bipolar disorder or bipolar depression. Seroquel or quetiapine, um, it's useful as a monotherapy. 
you know, and, and this is the interesting part of psychopharmacology and the the benefit of you know really understanding the um, the pharmacologic mechanisms of these agents because I never understood why you know quetiapine can treat mania and it can treat depression. How does it do that? How does it know which which pole it's treating? Um, but it has to do with the the um, pharmacologic uh, actions of the agents. So Symbiax is an interesting uh, agent. It's a combination of fluoxetine and olanzapine, which is shown to be, um, compared to placebo, <laughs> superior in improving symptoms of depression and bipolar disorder. You know, I was taught as a resident physician many years ago that these kind of combination agents where you can't change the doses are not really a good way to go, but apparently this has been useful. And it's a, a way for fluoxetine, the manufacturers of Prozac and Zyprexa to get a little more money uh, for the to extend the patent on their drugs. Um, and the combination is superior to olanzapine alone. So what I said about the use of antidepressants is kind of modified by this um, this drug, but I think that the point is that when you add a mood stabilizer to an antidepressant, you may be getting the best of both worlds. Um, so in, if you're uh, treating somebody with bipolar dis depression, you know, you want, probably want a mood stabilizer on board to make sure that they're, you've got a maintenance treatment and a, a prophylactic agent. And some people, even though, you know, they, they're on a mood stabilizer, may require another one. So the example here is a patient who's taking lithium who has a depressive episode might benefit from adding a second generation antipsychotic such as quetiapine uh, or a patient who's maintained on olanzapine might benefit from adding lithium. So there's a lot of, it's like being a good cook um, is having a variety of options to, to treat the patient. So the goal of maintenance therapy is to prevent or reduce the number of subsequent cycles. Um, and uh, agents that are approved to do this are lithium, lamotrigine, the second generation antipsychotics, olanzapine, aripiprazole, and quetiapine. So these are the agents that are FDA approved to prevent um, cycles. Um, so this, this says typically we start treatment with monotherapy, but we, we know that we may need to add something um, because the, just having a single agent may be insufficient. And lithium uh, is as good a choice as any, and that really is my, if the person's young and healthy, lithium is probably the best um, long-term solution. It's been around forever. You know, it has been studied. We know all about it. A lot of times when they bring new drugs to the market after they've been on the market for, you know, 10 years, oops, they all of a sudden find this pattern of, you know, side effects that uh, occur that they didn't really know about in the beginning. So I, I like lithium because it's a tried and true agent. Um, Lamotrigine may be a good choice. It's tolerated well except for that, you know, one in 1,000 uh, risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And it seems to be helpful in patients who have uh, difficulty with depressions. Aripiprazole, as I said, has the advantage of weight, uh, doesn't cause weight gain. Um, and the combination of a second generation agent and a mood stabilizer is probably, uh, you know, a good bet for um, making sure the patient stays stable. We talked about rapid cycling. These are four or more uh, cycles a year. And this is maybe something to know if you're treating uh, somebody with bipolar disorder that the use of antidepressants uh, without the concomitant use of a mood stabilizer, stimulant medications like what's used for ADHD or drugs like amphetamine, um, steroids and, you know, heavy caffeine use can all contribute to 
uh, rapid cycling. So if you have somebody that's bouncing around, you know, from uh, one pole to the next, it, it may be, you may caution them about the use of these agents. Shift work is not a good idea in people with mood disorders, and especially people with bipolar disorder. Um, you know, not having a good sleep pattern, sleep disruption, disruption stress can be a trigger to a, a manic uh, episode. Substance abuse, again, that's a no-brainer. And low thyroid, um, untreated thyroid problems. I, we said this before, you know, this rapid cycling pattern may be less responsive to lithium and more responsive to uh, Depakote uh, and other anticonvulsant agents. May require a combination approach. Lamotrigine has been useful. Um, and second generation agents have shown more success. Mixed states, again, uh, the person meets criteria for both mania and depression for at least seven days. This is a very interesting phenomenon. It may, it may represent actually a transition from one pole to the next. It may be um, that that's why they're exhibiting both uh, symptom patterns. Um, Depakote again uh, and carbamazepine as well as the second generation agents may be helpful. And here we go with a nice picture that kind of represents uh, the ups and downs of bipolar disorder. So that's the end. I know I gave you a lot of information. Anybody have questions? I was affiliated with a residential program, and there seemed to be a, a real strong belief about um, the prevalence of what they refer to as rapid cycling uh -huh. in kids, okay? meaning rapid cycles over the course of a day. Yeah. You know, is your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, th I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I'm not a child psychiatrist, so I, that's the caveat, but I think to, to have true bipolar disorder, you have to have cycles that are clearly delineated. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this rapid cycling means four, pa four a year. There is a f something called, a phenomenon called ultra-rapid cycling, you know, which might be, you know, every week you have a cycle or something. But the phenomenon of up and down <coughs> during a day, I think, is more consistent with mood instability related to, you know, issues like personality disorder. Now, in children, it might be conduct issues or oppositional defiant stuff or, um, but that's mood reactivity um, rather than true bipolar disorder. Any other questions? Well, thank. Oh, yes. Doctor, being someone who doesn't prescribe medication, uh -huh. I was wondering what is the process like to assess whether a patient or a client might benefit from a given medication? I think if you're doing good therapy, evidence-based uh, psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, or whatever the, whatever you're doing, and you're doing it well, and the person's not responding, you know that's a, that's where you might want to get a second opinion uh, from a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner about whether medication may be beneficial. You know, what's the diagnosis? Um, have you applied the most uh, appropriate psychotherapy? And if that's not helping, then you know I'd certainly look to somebody to give you a second opinion. <coughs> Well, thank you very much. You've been a rapt audience. <laughs> I hope I didn't put you to sleep. Um, I, I think it's really important um, to really be more informed. I think as, as non-medical behavioral health um, um, professionals, it's dangerous to not know. Okay? The, the evidence in terms of research, in terms of the efficacy or the effectiveness, of the combination of therapy and medications is indisputable. Um, so it, it, it's worrisome to me um, that there still is, um, I'll say maybe a naivete and maybe an idealism about the use of medications. Because even looking at the use of omega fatty acids and, and nutrition, what it still suggests is, which is obvious if you think about it, 
the body's mood is affected by its biology and its biological function. There's no disputing that. Um, so I, I think there's sometimes a skepticism um, that in terms of client quality of life um, really is, is, is a, a dangerous thing. Okay? When you have psychiatrists like um, Dr. Lee, who I've seen argue against the use of medications inappropriately, because she understands, um, again, that there's an over-reliance, particularly on this day and age. Um, it's refreshing to have a psychiatrist that understands the politics of the drug industry and is unwilling to bend on that. Okay? Um, and so we're really very fortunate to have somebody, not only of her kind of demeanor and, um, and I guess, humanity, but her level of expertise would be hard for me to explain to you, okay? Except to say that somebody who is the medical director of a state hospital has got some snap to him, okay? <laughs> um, and so we fully appreciate that. And I think as, as you get further into the field and understand um, the relationships between psychiatry and psychology and, um, and develop a relationship with your own psychiatrist, you'll recognize how unique she is in terms of having a, such a balanced view of um, understanding the holistic aspects of health and the application of medications is not contradictory to holistic health. When practiced appropriately, it's actually inclusive of that. Um, all medications do is compensate for failed biological systems. Um, and so you need to look at it that way. No different from having asthma, no different from having other conditions um, that have nothing to do with character and morality. It has to do with genetic lotteries. Um, luckily, most of you in the room, you know, were a benefit to the genetic lottery. That basically says all of us are subject to genetic randomness. And then all of us have certain strengths um, that are part of your genetic makeup. And all of us have certain liabilities, some of which are in invisible and dormant in terms of day-to-day -day needs. Certain things that you are deficit at that you will never discover because it will never be meaningful in the course of how you conduct your lives. That's not the case in these disorders where there are clear overt functional deficits to the demands of living in a world that's becoming increasingly demanding. So I think it's really important to you know, put on check those kind of naive, um, and skeptical aspects or, or attitudes toward the use of pharmacology because research is real clear and practice is real clear that the, the, the um, relationship that we've developed in, at Bayless here, um, that we are still developing and stronger with the, introduce, the introduction of integrated health, having our own primary care physicians here is, is a real statement of our belief and conviction and commitment to integrated health. Um, so now think about, and I'd like to have you be a little more courageous, okay? What are your thoughts and what are your beliefs and what have you seen with regard to the attitude of professionals to the use of medications when it comes to psychiatric disorders? Okay. I know there are people in here that have very strong thoughts about holistic health. How does this sit with you? I came from the medical world where mm -hmm. the prescription meds all the time. Then going into the program, the doctorate program, clinical psychology, it's like no meds, like we can fix this problem. And then actually in practice, finding that happy ground that sometimes just therapy alone isn't good enough and that they really do need a mood stabilizer or something else, especially to get them to a point where therapy is going to actually work. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we can talk about tapering off mm -hmm. after that, if, if that's mm -hmm. what they want, you know, or, so really finding that middle ground, I think is really important. Very. Okay. Other thoughts? I think my biggest,
concerns at this point working in the kids with the kid in the kids department is seeing how many kids are diagnosed with bipolar disorder mm -hmm. at three and four years of age, five, six, and then putting them on these really strong <laughs> medications. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's my biggest because I do see exactly what you said. You know, the combination can be really helpful, especially mm -hmm. some of those thirteen-year-old boys oh. who are just you know aggressive and. Um, getting them to, to a point where you can actually work with them a little bit more therapeutically. But with the three and four year olds, that's, that's hard for me. And I think what's interesting is, is uh, ironically, some of the complaints we get is our prescribers refusing to medicate. Mm -hmm. They will not medicate when it comes to children under the age of four years old. They just won't do it, okay? And we get complaints about that um, from parents who understandably may be desperate and the question I was posing had to do with that issue of looking at children who are reactive emotionally to things in their social, environmental, economic um, circumstances and understandably have major shifts in mood um, and how interpreting that as a bipolar disorder and then medicating it really borders on unethical. Okay. Um, because again, it really, it, it's a lack of understanding of the true mechanism of bipolar disorder as a physiological syndrome. And it, 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 pride, it, it provides a semblance of, of science by imposing um, diagnostic conditions of bipolar that are totally contradictory to the DSM-IV and any interpretation of professionals of the bipolar disorder simply by saying, well, because the person's mood changes quickly, um, they must be rapid cyclers, not understanding what ri rapid cycle bipolar is. Okay? And then it sets people up, parents <coughs> and professionals, up for this belief in this magic bullet. And then, as you can see, the side effects are devastating. I've seen kids gain 30, 40 pounds, um, put on mood stabilizers, um, with very little effect in terms of mood stabilization. And then you end up layering and trying multiple um, uh, combinations on a child who is still growing um, and, and subject to potential long-term effects, let alone the short-term effects of image and, and esteem um, to a kid growing up who's now put on 30 and 40 pounds. Health, early diabetes, all those kinds of things. Um, so it's very important to know your science. <coughs> and be wary of, of idiosyncratic interpretations. Um, what I've seen is outpatient agencies, residential programs, develop sometimes their own um, kind of belief systems and culture about certain things. Um, and I think it's important as you step out into the world that you know your science, that you know what the diagnostic criteria are, and that you're very clear um, about what these different labels mean in terms of bipolar disorder. Because um, there's a lot of misinformation in the general public about what bipolar disorder is. It's not just a matter of changing moods. Because if you're in changing circumstances, there will be changing moods, and you can't medicate that. Okay? The question is understanding that in the constitution of the individual, um, there are these cycles that cannot be accounted for by situational variables. There's no divorces. There's no um, violence in the neighborhoods. There's no economic distress of loss of homes and disruptions of movement. There's none of that okay, um, that you can predictably associate with a significant and dramatic change of mood. And that's the piece where you know, your families rely on you um, for some clarity and that you're not going to continue to promote pseudoscience um, by looking at you know, what's the latest newspaper say about this particular disorder or um, the fringe areas of psychology today. And don't get me wrong, I love psychology today, but there's a fringe there that sometimes gets crossed over and we have to be careful about that. Okay. Other thoughts about medications and um, diagnosis? I think my, <clears throat> my biggest frustration lately has been fighting stigma within the client. Um, and seeing how much society has painted them a strict belief system on um, psychiatric care, uh, which leads them to not show up to their med appointments, mm -hmm. um, non-compliance with their medication, 
or they'll get stable and then they'll drop their medication. They don't need it. Um, yeah, and they're they're good, so then they stop. Um, so trying to deal with that and getting them motivated, and if they're really depressed or if they're manic and think that they're fine, um, you know, getting them to come in. You know, I've I've had a few clients like that that um, you know you're just kind of left going, where do I go from here? What do you do? I'm not taking medication to see a shrink because I ain't crazy. Okay. Um, I don't need it anymore. I feel better. Well, maybe it's because, okay? <laughs> and that's one of the <coughs> hardest things about bipolar disorder. When you're in the, those deep, dark trenches of depression, then you in, end up being both more amenable to assistance but more at risk for suicide. It is a very dangerous teeter-totter. And then who doesn't want to feel better? And then you hit maybe a hypomanic phase and your perception, some possibly real, but the research disputes it, um, is that you become more creative. It's more likely that you have more energy to take advantage of creativity. Um, so it's a secondary effect. Uh, you see the same thing with kids you know, smoking and getting high on marijuana who say that they think clearer. Okay. There may be a similar kind of thing um, where it takes the edge off of the depression, um, but it doesn't make you happier Okay. It just takes the edge off of it so that there is the possibility to think. But then in either case, there's this jerks dotson curve. At what point does the medication become more sedative and creates lethargy and a lack of initiative on both sides? Over-medication happens whether it's street depressants or antidepressants and mood stabilizers. So, you know, again, important to be able to inform your clients and, and, and struggle with that. that would make, the consistency of treatment is really hard with bipolar disorder. Um, really hard. Um, and then you have those stigmas that you're talking about. How do you explain to a client, adult or otherwise, why you're taking this medication? If I'm, my perception is, you're, it means I'm crazy if I go see a shrink. Now, if, if you have those similar biases, how are you going to make that argument? What are you going to say to a mother of a kid or an adult client who is, as Dr. Leeds says, not responsive to treatment that's evidence-based, meaning that people generally respond to this. That's your first clue, that there's something else that you may need to take a look at. How are you going to tell me that I need to see a shrink? Okay, So you want to give that a shot? I think a lot of it has <laughs> to do with education, and like what you explained earlier, that it's a physiological thing that's mm -hmm. going on, and the way to balance it out is through medication. Mm -hmm. and just explaining the cycle of it and what it looks like and it's harder to do with younger people I think they don't buy into mm -hmm. it as much as parents so if you can get the parents to buy into it and then have them support their child especially if it's a teenager 16 17 18 year old teenager how can you get the parents to buy into that kind of support system mm -hmm. and consistency and them understanding I think more importantly than the child so they mm -hmm. can implement these things before this person's out on their own and that piece is real critical, which accounts for some of the struggles I know that we have with children and adolescents. Because even if the kid is supportive, and it might just be because they enjoy the nature of the relationship, mm -hmm. and that does happen. Having somebody to talk to, having somebody to confide in, having a credible adult, they like that. But what message are they getting from their parents mm -hmm. about medications and what it means? You know, that could be undermining um, of this kid's otherwise acceptance of trusting you and saying that maybe maybe there's something in me that's out of balance as opposed to something wrong with me inherent to my character and moral moral structure you know but then you have a parent you know no kid of mine's going to take any medications or you're not crazy you're not doing any that or just not bringing we've had situations where the relationship was strong enough in a kid that the kid got in the cab themselves and came to the clinic on their own. So it's about credibility um, and authority figures, and you have to fight that battle because if you can't win over, this is again neutrality. When you're working with kids, by definition, you're working with the family. You alienate the parents, don't be surprised that you're not going to be seeing the kid anymore because they just won't show up. So it's very important to be careful of seeing your role not as an advocate. Okay, but as a interventionist that's responsible <coughs> for the whole family. Because once you go to advocacy, 
it means you're now in an adversarial position against somebody. Okay, you have to be very careful of that. Um, at the same time, there are things that need to be advocated for effective treatment, but be careful um, because the person that's the most vulnerable will pay the price for upsetting a system that you may not be aware of. If you tick off a CPS worker, don't be surprised that that's going to have repercussions with the kid and the family and the parents. Um, if you alienate a probation officer, don't be surprised that that may create ripples in your relationships with the kid and the probation officer. You have to understand the value and importance of CPS, the value and importance of probation, the value and importance of medical prescribers and primary care physicians, the value and importance of parents, and the value and importance of your kids. Um, there's particularly a tendency, I think, for therapists to align with children, either consciously or covertly, at the expense of their relationship with the, ad the other adults in lives. And you become quietly in competition with the other adults for who's the best, quote, parent. Okay, you win, but now your kid's not seeing you anymore because the parents aren't bringing them. So, this is not about win or losing, it's about effective intervention and making sure you work with all parties who have a stake um, in this kid's health and success in the future. It's really one of the most common mistakes I see when it comes to family work. Aligning with a particular subgroup or faction at the expense of others. You're taking the systems here. You, you can't change and affect one without changing all the others. Other thoughts? Yes? I have two thoughts. One is I have a client who is diagnosed with bipolar. And one thing that I've noticed is that the parents who I treat with compassion, because it seems that they're looking for you to fix that problem. And it's, I don't think there's a clear understanding that this is something that this child's going to have to live with basically the rest of their life. So, but they're but they're expecting you to, like, they expect the problem to go away one day. Mm -hmm. And there's not that mm -hmm. clear understanding that it's not. It's just something that has to be worked with, as you said. It's not the problem. It's not within them. It's just something that has to be worked with. And another um, thought that came to my head when Dr. Lee was talking about omega-3 is like, that was an eye-opener for me. I am into holistic medicine. <coughs> to get a clear understanding of understanding <coughs> natural medicine, mm -hmm. you know, that can improve Thank you. a condition of one of my clients is awesome. Yeah. If you do not know about omega-3 and its effect on mood, do yourselves a favor and find out, okay? Because what I can tell you is that every day in my house, pomegranate juice is the juice that we drink. Okay, because it's heavy in omega-3, okay? Um, my kid, my wife, myself, okay? The research, double-blind, is indisputable in terms of the effects of omega-3 on long-term mood stabilization in children, okay? Um, and I'm very familiar with that research she cited because if some of you know, I, I still have an affiliation with Youth Service International, which runs juvenile facilities all over the country. I'm trying to get them to look at, as a matter of practice, um, the inclusion of vitamin supplements, specifically omega-3, omega with all the dietary practices in these resident programs that I run. Because that piece of research, it wasn't the only one too, is dramatic in showing a clear association and relationship between the introduction of omega-3 and the reduction of violence and aggression in a, in a population of teenagers um, who were at histories of, of patterns of aggression, violence, and emotional reactivity. Um, there's a gentleman down in Tucson named uh, Dennis Embry, who's the founder of Peace Builders, um, who was an extremely strong advocate of this, and I'm hoping I might be able to get him to come up as a, as a personal favor. Um, he's, a, he's a totally unique individual in every way, um, but has a reputation for understanding the research in this particular area. So, plus the other stuff he's done with Peace Builders as, as the founder of that program that's gone global. Um, so you, you just, 
I've got an article on that too. In fact, if you're interested in doing that, um, I'll, it's about omega threes and the effect on mood stabilization. So, fish, pomegranate, walnuts, um, other foods that are high on omega three. Okay, which means that you can have snacks, healthy fruits, and healthy entrees, all of which um, have high omega three content. So, so, plus they also come in gel form. Okay which is the only thing that I do take besides eating. So, and I don't think I've ever been, been accused of being emotionally out of control or erratic. Okay. <laughs> okay. Although there are times when I've had <coughs> cause to, okay. Um, but it's just, I also think it may have, I don't know, I, I've eaten fish as long as I can remember. I'm not a big beef eater. I don't eat beef. Not as a matter of diet, I just like the taste of salmon and fish. Salmon high omega-3 content, by the way. Okay. Um, so think about that. So, so I'll, I'll grab a couple articles and make them available to those that are interested. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was excited to hear her say that um, psychiatry is looking more into nutritional yes. things. That's the new um, way. I think that is just awesome because I worked with a kiddo who she ate sugar all day and then her parents would give her melatonin mm -hmm. at night to sleep. And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't make yeah. sense to me, and I think sometimes we overlook the things that common sense would help with. Mm -hmm. that we There's an interesting uh, kind of cartoon on this that's circulating in psychiatry about the evolution of psychiatry. And it starts with people looking like cave people, and medicine is eat this root, okay? And then it evolves to the Middle Ages where it's, um, you know, it has something to do with the whole idea of blood leaching. Okay, draining blood out of your system to take this pill, to take this simple supplement with ages and times, you know, 2000 or 1800s, 1900s, and under 2050, it's a psychiatrist all dressed up for me saying, Eat this root. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, kind of a cycle mm -hmm. of coming back to understanding that all these medications are artificial means of trying to replicate natural biological processes, okay? So, why not go back to the natural biological process when you can, okay? I think nutrition is very important, having proper, but also working with clients with lower socioeconomic status, it can be very challenging, as we know that these nutritional foods can be very expensive. Um, when I was in the Chandler area, there was a food bank where anybody could go, and they're given very nutritional foods. And all they had to do was provide a proof of address or bill or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but working outside of the Chandler area, finding those supports and those places for people to find nutritional foods at the right price where they can get there, I think is more of a challenge mm -hmm. for some of the families, especially those families who don't drive. Mm -hmm. They don't, may not have um, access to those places. I don't know if you have any suggestions on how yes. to help those families? fish is cheaper than beef. <laughs> well, a lot of them are eating like macaroni and cheese and ramen and all the starchy foods because it's so cheap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that's where you, you want to find out what kinds of foods, including snacks, have omega content versus the other stuff that's just full of fats, okay? Um, because keep in mind, there's, there's, there's two fronts to this battle. One is the, the healthy stuff that's not being eaten, the other is the junk that is being eaten, mm -hmm. okay? And that includes, you know, most stuff that comes in a cell phone bag, okay? You know, that's crunchy when you chew on it, okay? Mm -hmm. Almost by definition, that's not going to be good for you. Um, because if you go out into nature, there are very few things that are naturally crunchy, okay? They're usually soft. So to make something crunchy so it makes that sound and people enjoy chomping on it, it means there's stuff that's been put into it that's probably not good for you. Okay. So you're really trying to get people to educate themselves on both sides. Um, and it's about physical exercise. That's part of holistic health, moving. Um, so I think it's interesting. It's a big push right now that says, maybe we should reintroduce recess into schools because kids should be epidemic of obesity. Okay, well, you know, school's not even having recess. I mean, I, I mean, come on, we have to connect with the dots sometimes. But that also means understanding when you're working with children and adults 
they were living in a culture that increasingly has become sedentary. So rather than having, you know, a, a um, Nintendo or iPod or all that other stuff, how about having an activity that requires movement? Even it's just having your kids and their parents walk through the park or around the block once. Because what's going to happen if they do that is they're going to talk. What's not going to happen if the kid is on the Nintendo or iPod is they're not going to talk. So what you want to do is, again, is, is truly look at holistic health, and that includes holistic health applied to relationships. What does it take to have a naturally occurring healthy relationship? The number one thing is conversation. And the problem is, if you look at entertainment and toys today, they're becoming more isolated. You don't actually need people, other people, to enjoy yourself. Or if you do, it can be a virtual person. Um, somebody you don't really have to really communicate with. Some stranger on the other side of a, you know, an electronic device that can also play games with you so you don't have to talk. So, you know, holistic health is not just about nutrition and eating and diet. It's about what is naturally healthy for human beings and how to inform people when they're moving away from their natural states of not just eating and nutrition, but also <coughs> conversation. Um, healthy relationships require certain basic elements too. So think about that when you're talking about health, broaden it to healthy living that will naturally result in a well-balanced um, human being and a relationship that has natural elements to it. So we're, we're fighting and losing a battle um, where it comes to convenience and the use of electronic devices or self-entertainment and substitution of human contact. So it, it really can't be surprising that we're seeing more and more situations at younger and younger ages where people seem, it, it's promoted as callousness, but really it's self-absorption. There's a difference between being callous to someone else and simply not being aware. Because I've got my little headset on and watching this little girl this morning and thinking I would never have done this. And walking across an intersection with a headset on and totally oblivious to the traffic around her. You know, we need to find ways to reconnect people with meaningful people in their lives and reconnect them with what's going on as opposed to look for ways they can buffer themselves from the overstimulation um, and living in little islands among themselves. So, and we're, we're losing that battle in my opinion. Our thoughts. Medications, diagnosis, bipolar, or depression, whatever. Okay. What are you seeing that now? You've seen cases now. What are you seeing now in terms of mood disorders and problems? And do you feel, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, some things that have been mentioned that come to mind is the stigma is a real threat. I think it doesn't go away quickly. And the continuation of medication, especially when they get better. So I try to have a conversation early on and attach the understanding of having this disorder with something that they can understand that might be a physical condition. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, if it's an older adult, either they might have diabetes or they know someone who does. Or even everyone has seen someone on oxygen, even if it's on a TV show. So, when they're thinking of going off, they have, it's like, okay, if that person needed oxygen, and then they started feeling better, and they were moving, they feel different. Mm -hmm. Whereas, that, and the same thing with diabetes, if your diet changes, your sleep pattern changes, so we are talking about the right person and showing that this is just another aspect of their health, whether it be dental, physical, mm -hmm. mental health. So, I, I think, you know, it's been an inroad that has allowed me to go back to that. Yeah. And uh, somehow, mental health, as we all know, is a stumbling block of folks. It's what First, people internally accepting it, and then yeah. there's some the system being educated. Mm -hmm. I think people are so busy defending their mental health that they're not addressing it, okay? Um, and that becomes problematic. So removing the stigma becomes really important. The, the challenge, or, or really the challenge is, 
how do you address that in a way um, that's that's less threatening? And this gets back to what I push constantly you guys to think about, and that is process. Okay, because it's about process and cause and effect. You know, if you, for example, have difficulty with paying your bills, and you get a job, and you start earning money, and you can pay your bills. Now that your bills are being paid, do you quit your job? Okay. Once you find a solution to the problem, the goal is to sustain the solution. And what you have to do is to make an argument to people that's about a self-sustaining, healthy way of approaching life, not arriving at it. Um, otherwise, now that you, let's say, you, you get your degrees conferred, does that mean you stop studying anymore because you've, you've reached it? No, you have to sustain it. So we try to make the argument in areas that are too specific where defenses are very thick and evo evocative. If you understand the process of what's going on, you can make the argument in logical ways where people will nod their heads and agree with you because most people would tend to agree with me that if you have a problem with your bills and you get a job and you start making money, now that you're paying your bills, they would pr probably agree that it doesn't make sense to quit your job. But they do the same thing. People do the same thing with their treatment of bipolar, the use of medications, because they're looking for an uh, endpoint solution in terms of strategic effectiveness. What's the strategy, not the answer? And that's something that if you're not careful of, you'll fall victim to that too. You're trying to find the answer to the problem as opposed to the strategy that prevents it. And so I'm looking at service plans now for, you know, a couple of you I'm going to be assuming, you know, Shelley and Sophia, I'm going to be assuming, you know, direct supervision. So I'm going to be giving some feedback on these things. And what the first thing I'm, I'm seeing, because remember I told you all when we did training, you're going to forget all this. Okay, and you did. So that's okay. I'm just letting you know that you did. <laughs> Look at your statement of goals and needs. And remember I said early, simple Maslow's hierarchy. Okay. Look for survival problems. If those aren't there, look for danger and safety problems. If that's not there, look for meaningful relationship problems. If that's not there, look for competency problems. And that's the need. A need to feel confident to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Okay? A, a need to feel valued by a certain person who you value. Um, a need to feel safe in a place where you don't feel safe. Okay? But if you look at your goals and needs statements, they're becoming wordy and detailed. Needs to learn to respect teachers and get us some work done. That's not a need. That's somebody else's desire. The question is, why is this kid not performing in school successfully? And the need is not to please somebody else. The need is for the kid to establish a feeling of confidence that he can be successful in school. A need is inside me. It's not what you require of me. Need to respect parents. That's not a need. The need may be a relationship. Needs to understand the importance and a sense of value and being loved by parents. Okay. So I told you you would forget. I was right. So go back to your needs and goal statements and understand the power and application of Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs, not hierarchy of requirements and complaints for other people, or hierarchy of, you know, self-perceptions of being deficit. I need to, you know, the client states that he needs to learn to be a, a better person. How, how did he come to the conclusion that he was a, inherently a bad person, and what can you do about that? Okay. Clearly there's some aspect of life where the person doesn't feel that they're competent and feel like they're a failure. What's that area where the person needs to restore a sense of confidence um, or improving self-esteem? I, I remember I said specifically going to fit this one. Self-esteem is not the source of any problem. It's a result of many. Feeling good about yourself isn't the issue. The issue is feeling effective in the world. Otherwise, you have a lot of like our lighthouse kids. They feel really good about the fact they can beat anybody down in the neighborhood. Okay, 
But why do they need to beat people down in the neighborhood? Because they feel ineffective as human beings. They're trying to prove themselves all the time. So feeling better about yourself or valuing who you are and appreciating those attributes because that's real. Making somebody feel good about themselves is really easy. Just say nice things to them. Pat them on the head and say you're a smart student, but that doesn't make you able to read. Okay. Self-esteem in school is a problem because it defeats self-efficacy, the feeling that you are capable of success. And so you have lots of students that are getting soft, warm, glowy, fuzzy stuff and they can't read. And that will take a hit to your self-concept. Self-esteem is lazy. Giving somebody a piece of candy, giving them this and that, they will feel better in that moment. So self-efficacy requires work. Can you work with me to have me see my abilities and strengths and appreciate those? So I value that these abilities and strengths will make me functional in the world and that I will be not just capable of success, but success will be, to be, will be expected. Okay. Can you give people the expectation of success? That's what you do. And you can't do that just by making them warm and fuzzy. Okay. So, other thoughts about your work in general? Not looking for answers, looking for thoughts. You're not in school. What are you thinking about your work and where it's going right now? I will pick on you, because you're at that point now where I have the right to do that. I can look at you and say, tell me what you're thinking about your work right now. What are you doing? Okay. But I'm not going to do that because I would be treating you like a student. You're professionals. Tell me what you're thinking about your work. What are the challenges you're experiencing? I know for me, one of the things you just said, like I'm just, it, you do, you get lost in the service plans yep. and you tend, you do tend to fall back into old patterns. And it's, I'm disappointed, I guess, a little bit in myself in that, how did I, how did I miss that? Because you're right. If you can teach these kids the value of, let's say, like the academic process or whatever, that they have all these learning disabilities or, um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about it. How can I establish, or get this, get a kid to realize the importance of being independent, having that self-efficacy. That's the question. And you have to, I mean, you ha again, you have to get the teachers involved and the family involved, and that's, it's a lot of buying in you gotta do for this particular, you know, issue. And that's tough. It, it is tough, which is why you can't afford to be lazy, and I'm going to insist that you're more ambitious than you've been taught. This is not about taking away pain and deficits. It's about creating joy, inspired living, and confidence. Where w You can't let yourself sink to a deficit reduction model. Let me have this person be less depressed and show fewer signs of depression. Okay, okay fine. The person isn't suicidal anymore and they're eating and walking, but do they have any hope for where their life is going, any plan and belief that they can get there? You know, that's the goal of therapy, not simply to reduce symptomology, but to create joyful, inspired, effective living. That's where as therapists, a lot of times people lack ambition. It's not a zero-sum game um, where we're trying to get the person to zero by reducing symptoms. Okay, now what? Now that I have energy, now what? Okay. Um, and as far as where you're talking about, it's the norm because you're human. It's why you have discussions and talking so you can remind yourself of the bigger picture. And you can beat yourself up for getting or appreciate the fact that you're smarter and wiser and can see it now. Okay. <laughs> see small things like that, even with clients. I, you know, you, I, you see this a lot. I can't believe the stupid stuff that I did in the past. Well, how could you see stupid stuff in the past unless you're wiser today? So you can beat yourself up for what you did in the past so you can appreciate the fact that you're seeing things more clearly today. Little things like that go you from zero sum to growing and feeling confident and, and liking who you are. What I noticed was that um, in the beginning when I started doing therapy, I would go into session so preoccupied and I would be listening to a client or even to supervision. Mm -hmm about, as you're talking about service plan, and I would stop at a some point re listening to what's being said, 
because I had this running dialogue in my head about past events or future preoccupations or whatever, whatever. Mm. So that was a phase in which I, that hindered my learning. So now I realize I didn't, I don't really know how to do service planning very well because the first time around, I didn't really hear it. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but. Anyway. Well, no, I'm saying it's not ridiculous. <laughs> it's why the first thing I told you all is everything I tell you, you're going to forget. Okay? Yeah. Because when you move people into a novel situation, the novelty is confusing, inspiring, exciting, scary. So, and you walk into a novel situation in terms of new therapists in an agency. It's going to be exciting, scary, and there's going to be distractions from the internal dialogue. Okay. If you just accept that, if you just accept the fact that you're human beings and not perfect, you're going to save yourself a world of aggravation mm -hmm. um, in terms of saying, okay, I. I forgot that, but people forget things. Now I remember. So good for me. Okay? It. It's that simple. I'm very special. So, but that, even in therapy, uh, going in into sessions, um, preoccupied, uh, what did I have to do with this person? Uh, what, are you, oh, you know, thinking back or thinking ahead or trying to think ahead and not really thinking anywhere. <laughs> then, second phase would be, all right. Let's just sit and see what comes up in the moment. What's arising in the moment? That was definitely more helpful. Called mindfulness. Much more helpful <laughs> in working what's here in the present. But I feel that something's lacking in what I would like to ask you as my supervisor. Um, oh, you can't do that because you have supervision later. Okay. <laughs> oh, <No>, sure. <laughs> as a personal goal. Okay. Is, uh, I hope to to develop from now on is to stay in the present but also to start thinking strategically outside of the session ahead and that I can't do yet and I think that's part of the treatment planning piece that I need to, to start developing. The power of therapy is not an activity it's a process okay that process is multi-layered it's like anything that as you become more comfortable with the superficial logistics you can do those and still entertain other possibilities. Um, that's true of everything. We think about the first time you, you drove a car, particularly with standard transmission. You are totally locked into the logistics of hitting the brake, turning the wheel, hitting the accelerator, shifting, hitting the clutch. You are totally absorbed. If somebody says, hey, Zach, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm driving here, okay, right? That's where people are with therapy at first even with their own clients. Be quiet, I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's natural. Okay. As things become, as you acclimate to certain things, then they become natural. You know, so you're not even thinking about hitting the, the turn signal. You probably forgot that you did. Um, you're not thinking about hitting the brake or the clutch or shifting. You, you do it while you're listening to the radio, tuning to another station, talking to somebody in the car next to you, and unfortunately sometimes texting on the telephone, okay? But the, the bottom line is, as you acclimate to your comfort level, you become aware of other layers of your current experience. See, the, the, the thing is that there are multiple things going around you all the time, not just in therapy. And for you to be tuned into it, um, you can't fight it. You take it in, and the more you get confident and calm about it, the more you see other things. And being open to the multiple layers of therapy. It, it's not a problem to listen and think at the same time, um, unless you get a insecure and obsessive about it. Um, and also keep in mind, you know, therapy is a process that's not a conversation that you miss. And even, I, I keep emphasizing, you have to understand the power of, of the process of therapy so that even if you come up with something later that you think about, oh, I should have said this. The, the, the cool thing about therapy, I don't care if it's a month later or two months later, you can go back and say, hey, John, remember when we were talking about this? You can go right back to it. It's not possible to miss anything because therapy allows you to go forwards and backwards backwards, remember we're talking about this, let's go back there for a second, or here's something I'd like you to think about moving into the future, okay, 
I'm not going to, I'll do all this when I turn 18. Okay, boom, you're 18 now. Now what? You just turned 18. Now what? Okay, see? Don't confuse that with a plan. <laughs> okay? So it's really important to understand, again, I really, um, I want to thank um, me and Jennifer for the article you sent me um, on the who is responsible for the therapy. The client's responsible for the actions, but the therapist is responsible for the therapy. Um, and I've talked again about you got to get comfortable with the fact that it is your process. You drive the process of therapy. The client's responsible for their decisions, choices, and bringing information to you, but no, make no mistake about it. You've been hired by your client and by us to be an active part of moving therapy, not a passive recipient where you're making commentary. Um, if somebody wants that, they can go home and watch television. Okay? and have, you know, comment on the TV, okay? Passive observation. That is not what you were trained to do, and it's not what your clients need. They need to, for you to be affecting what's happening, a catalyst for what's happening, an active ingredient of this process, and that you drive this process. The important thing is to know where you're driving it and why, because the client determines that. The process is driven based on client needs, but it's driven by the therapist until the client can drive it themselves. And that's why we'll talk a little bit about the whole idea of therapeutic terminations. Because the preparation for the client being able to drive is very, very important. I don't mean the cliche thing that says, yeah, you start um, <coughs> discharge at the first day. Um, that's true, but not in the sense that people think it is, okay? Um, you need to drive and be comfortable with driving the therapy. And that's something that I'm hoping that you'll go into, okay? Okay. Other thoughts, comments about where your work is taking you right now? Yes? Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, I approached my clients, like I approached any other relationship with my mm -hmm. And that being that, when I meet somebody new, you know, that I'm going to listen to you and listen to you and let you talk and hear what you're about. <clears throat> but there's going to come a time when I'm collecting all this information on how you speak, what you're saying, what's coming to your, you know, mm -hmm. the thought. And then I'm going to sit there and whether you like it or not, in a nice way, say, okay, well, you know, you told me this, and how come we're not doing this? And I know that, you know, so all of this is going to be, not in a hard way, but thrown in your face, like, okay, well, mm -hmm. I know this is what you do. I know these are your habits. I know this is what you said. I know that what you like. I know what you don't like. Mm -hmm. And then I approach the client that way. Mm -hmm. And with kids, you know, and sometimes they just smile because they're looking at me like, oh, my God, this lady is going to face me, I mean, she's going to approach me with this now, you know, like they don't want to approach it, but they smile about it because they know that they're not getting away with anything, mm -hmm. in essence. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And what I would say in that situation is, understand again, process and content. Mm -hmm. The therapy is addressing the kid's ambivalence about approaching it, not mm -hmm. what it is exactly. that they're afraid to address. Exactly, and okay. that they're not going to be able to sidestep it. What makes you afraid? Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen? What Again, what happens is we get caught up in the specifics of the content. Uh, we get caught up into the secret the person isn't telling us. And we want to know the secret, not why the secret is being kept. The therapy is why the secret is being kept. The secret itself is just a tool to do the therapy. We get too content focused and it shows up in goals and treatment plans. The process of what's going on is where therapy happens, change and sustainable change. Um, so we have to be very careful of that. The other part too is, is there's a piece to that that we have to think about. That is, do your clients understand what therapy is and what their responsibility in it is? Oh, they'll say, okay, give me a pill, and yes, you know, you're my therapist, 
but do they have a sense of their responsibility in this relationship and what it is that they're expected to do and what their contribution is? That includes simple things like honoring the commitment of a therapy hour that you've arranged and being there when the appointment is made. That's an expectation because it's the only way we can get work done um, by making sure this is a priority for you and not being too dismissive of that. Okay? And having clients understand this is a mutual agreed upon contractual arrangement that says this hour will be set aside by you or by me devoted to the examination of your life and your decisions in life and that that means this hour needs to be set aside by you as a point of work that we can then look at how the rest of your life is going and where you can apply these things. Okay? So the question is, does your client understand what it means to be a client? And that there are expectations associated with that that they're expected to fulfill. And I'm not sure that's the case. Um, it's kind of like more going to the grocery store and purchasing something. I can go or not go. Okay. The grocery store's not going to call me and say, hey, you forgot to get your food today. Okay. Well, that's not the way this is. So do your clients really understand what it means to be, what their role is in this process? I don't think we talk about that. Sometimes not at all. And I'm just saying that's a mistake. Because then you can't criticize somebody for not fulfilling a role that's never been clarified to them. Not realizing that canceling an appointment is a big deal. It's a huge deal, actually. And as opposed to, hey, you know, I can't come. And you say, no, that's okay. When else can we get together? I say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We talked about this. Because, again, how a person approaches their therapy will be indicative of the failed strategies of how they're approaching their life. Inconsistency, fear, and avoidance of fear, priorities and distractions. I don't want to come to therapy because I don't want to talk about that. Okay? Or, I don't want to come to therapy today because I have to go shopping. Okay? Let's examine that because how the person approaches their therapy will provide you with insights about what's not working and how they're approaching their life. Okay. Particularly fear and avoidance and the difficulty of establishing priorities in a consistent way. So, so we have to add those pieces on too. Otherwise, as you say, it is a matter of taking things in before you make a decision. And as I mentioned last week, one of the strongest therapy killers is making a decision and the client looks at you and said, we tried that before and it didn't work. Now you're, you're probably toast as far as confidence in the therapeutic work. Always know what's been done. Always know what's worked before. Always know what didn't work before. Just so that you don't trip yourself up and compromise the hopefulness and credibility the clients have in you as a therapist because we're revisiting things that didn't work. That is a therapy killer, making a suggestion that the person was told to do before it didn't work, and it didn't work. Okay, so don't move too fast. You know, you don't have to you don't have to answer have the answer in the first session. You really don't. <laughs> okay, um, so slow is the fastest way to go. Slow and thorough, like you're talking about. Take information in. Build a relationship. Okay. Slow and thorough. No, I was going to say, and I've slowed down. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and by slowing down, you go faster. It's an interesting thing. By slowing down, you will move your clients faster. Because the more you push, the more they will push back or escape or avoid. Which means that um, you will spend more energy getting less far. Spend less energy and devote yourself more to being mindful. Look for the multiple layers and look for the parallels. You know, one of the therapists is, was talking about, well, all I'm doing is playing cards with this kid today. Yeah, but, you know, part of what you're trying to teach him is the importance of learning and accepting other people. So make sure that your client 
teaches you how to play this card game and express the appreciation. You know, I didn't know that. It's really helpful when you explain things to me that I didn't know how to do. Now I'm getting it. Okay? That's therapy. That's not just playing cards. If you're aware and work with it. So know the parallels, create the parallels, construct the parallels, but always identify the parallels. And the other thing too is the client's interacting and talking to her throughout the entire session. The biggest complaint, doesn't talk, doesn't communicate. So the question is, why is he talking and communicating <coughs> to you in this moment? When you can figure that out, you can work with this client to get them to create conditions in which he will communicate, will talk, and will interrupt. Will interrupt. But you got to figure out what the condition is that's allowing that. Well, he trusts me. Ah. So is that an issue of not talking? Or is there a failure of trust in this particular person's life with those who are assuming that he trusts? They're assuming he trusts and refusing to talk. Maybe he's not talking because the trust is not there. So think about that. Maslow's hierarchy, again, needs to feel valued and safe in a relationship <coughs> with those responsible for his care. You look at his history and you see clearly there's nothing there that would suggest that he has something to make that come to that conclusion of. No consistency, fear, dangerous home environments, disruptions, moves from various guardians and custodial parents or adults. What would you do if every week or so somebody said, okay, this is your supervisor now. Another supervisor for a week. Okay, this is your supervisor now. Another supervisor for a week. Okay, this is your supervisor now. You're going to really invest time and energy in building a relationship, knowing that it's just going to be somebody else next week? And is that a deficit in the kid or a problem in the circumstances of how this kid's life is being managed? Okay. Don't get so locked into the problem that you don't see what the problem is. It doesn't talk to people. Of course not, okay? <laughs> Why would he under these circumstances? So, okay. This is a great time to be open to learning in its broadest sense. You're not going to be graded on your work here. It simply will be a point of conversation. And that way it'll help you get rid of the noise. Am I doing the right thing? Will you listen to this tape of my session? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I can tell you this is a lousy session or this is a great session. I don't evaluate. I want you to tell me what happened and what you're going to do next. So. Okay. Other thoughts about where you are or things that you're needing. I know caseloads are starting to build. We're, we're starting to pick up. We had a slowdown during the holidays, which always happens. And then referrals pick up in January, and they're flying like nobody's business in January and March. So, um, so that's already picking up big time. Okay, so yeah, yeah. that should work. Its way out already is. Yes, sir. Um, what do you think about uh, uh, parents being the ones who, who are, are unable to bring their their children to session, or they're looking for excuses not to bring their children to session? Okay. Well, here's here's the thing. Okay. If you assume that people will always pursue what they think is best for them. Then you have to ask yourself, what is it about bringing my child to a session that may make me want to not want to do it? Okay. What do you think? You're, you're the parent. If you want to know why people do things, put yourself in the position and ask yourself, what would it take for you to do that? You're the parent. You have a kid that needs help. Why would you not bring them? 
I, I get that it could be anything. Be like, oh, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll think I'm a bad parent or something. Yeah, of course. Or You're a lousy parent. Yeah, they'll, okay. they'll be the cause of it. One extreme. Not going to work. Yeah. Okay. So that's the process. Unless you deal with that, you are not going to move forward. The doubt that this is going to work or the feeling that I'm going to be implicated. Unless you deal with that, it is not going to work and proceed. So, you know, we have to know where the clients are at. We talk about engagement, um, but engagement is not just about therapy goals. It's about knowing where your client is at and meeting them there in such a way you can move them forward through their ambivalence. Again, motivational interviewing. There's a reason to do it and a reason not to do it. The reason to do it is often self-evident. The reason not to do it, not so much. And we focus all of our energy on the two obvious things. The reason why you should do it and what will happen if you don't. Okay, okay those things are obvious. Here's the question you have to ask yourself, which is about motivational interviewing. What are the competing interests, interests of ambivalence? Meaning, what is going to cost me to do this? If I do this, how is this going to cost me? And if I don't do this, what do I stand to gain? See, if I don't go, nobody's going to criticize me as a parent. So I stand something to gain by not going. If I do go, I can get criticized and blamed. So it's going to cost me if I go. So decision making is too simple. Decision making is why you should do something um, because of the pluses and why you should not do something because of the minuses. That's simplistic. It's lazy. Decision stopping is the issue. What motivates me to continue to do something that you think I should not do? And what motivates me not to do something you think I should? Until you can get there, that's the process issue, then you're going to be stuck. So again, it's about ambivalence. People will do, always, people will do what they think is in their best interest. Even the person that takes their own life. In that moment, they're thinking that's the best thing to do. Now, the distortions and thinking that goes along with coming to that conclusion is what we're working on. So, ask yourself in any situation where you feel like you're in an adversarial position, what would it take for you to do the same thing that your client is doing? Because it will drive you to the process and not the content. I'm a great therapist. They should give you help. And then you come to those conclusions. Doesn't care about the kid, unmotivated, all that stuff. That basically says, the reason why this person's not coming is because they're a lousy parent. Maybe they're a good parent that's scared. So, always assume people will always do what's in their best interest. If they're not, what is it that they think it's going to cost them to do this? And if you can figure that out, then you can get things moving, simply by having a discussion about it. Let's say you know that's the case. You all know that's the case with families, with parents. They're going to have these wonders about whether they're going to be blamed and wonders about whether it's going to work. So why not have that conversation at the front end? A lot of parents, you know, when they first come in, they really feel like people are going to blame them for messing up their kids. Or they're not really sure it's going to work because they've tried things before and it didn't work. Or So let's talk about that for a second. Right away your credibility goes up. The way you raise credibility is by speaking the truth. The way you lose it is by ignoring the truth. So. Ask yourself, what is the process here? And if you don't deal with the process, you're not going to get to the content. I know that it's difficult sometimes to make things a priority because of lots of distractions. This is not about being a good parent. It's about the pressures, pools, distractions, and fears that all good parents have. The reason why this is happening is because you do care about your kid and you do care about being a good parent and it does matter to you that people see that you care about and love your kid they're going to listen to that because that's true 
the stuff that gets in the way of being effective as a parent isn't about whether parents love their kids. It's about being overwhelmed, distracted, afraid, worried, desperate. It's them caring about kids desperately that cause them to do things that are desperate that cause problems. And you, you have to understand again that judging people and understanding people are two different things. If you judge people, you're not going to understand them. If you understand them, you're not going to waste time judging them. You have to know the difference between the two. Parents are afraid they're going to be judged. Kids too. Adults in general. I'm crazy, right? This means I'm crazy, right? There's something wrong with me, right? They may not ask you directly, but by virtue of coming to you, there's an implicit, there's an implicit condemnation of self. How do you deal with that? You gotta talk about it. And it's not just about the, the details of the dilemma they're in. I'm depressed, okay. But what does that mean to you? I have bipolar disorder. Okay, but do you know what that is? I think my kid has ADHD. A lot of parents who's, who think they have kids have ADHD have feelings about that. Tell me about you. We'll figure out whether it's true or not. What is it like for you as a parent? Sometimes parents worry that people are going to blame them. They worry that they're not a good parent. They're going to be accused of not caring the kids. What do you think? This is about using your knowledge. You're not studying anymore. You're applying what you've learned. Use it. You learn. You know a lot more than you think you do. The great thing is so do the parents and kids. They know a lot more than they think they do. Your job is not to change them, but to have them see fully what they're able to do, capable of doing. To see fully what they know. For them to see it. You don't have to change them. You just have to get them to see themselves better. And to have more confidence in who who they are, who they're capable of becoming. So you don't change people, you just clarify for them who they really are and what they're capable of. You don't have the power to change people because you're not God. The great thing is, in spite of what some of you sometimes think, you don't have to be God to be effective. Remember, frustration is you forgetting. There is a difference between the way you want things and the way things are. forget that, but you will, every time you get frustrated. I think this person should be that way. Well, they should be the way they are. The question is, can they see what they're capable of becoming? More importantly, can you see it? And can you show me that I am capable of doing things, understanding things beyond my self-imposed limit that has me condemn myself as being defective in some way, and ineffective and inefficient and a failure and all those other things. That's how I see myself. You don't have to change me. Can you have me see myself differently? That's the work that you're doing. So 